We certainly want to express our appreciation again for all of those that are with us. We're so happy that you are here. We do hope that you'll keep in mind the upcoming gospel meeting that begins next week. Brother Parker is an outstanding preacher of the gospel. It's not the man, though. It's the message that makes the difference, and we are grateful for the message that he will be preaching and has been preaching across the years and the effectiveness of the ministry of this good man. I hope that you'll be planning to be here for the very first service next Lord's Day and for every service of this gospel meeting, and that you will encourage others, that you will encourage them to come and be with us so that the most possible good can be accomplished in the preaching of the gospel during, during that upcoming week. We're going to speaking, be speaking today on the subject of From Here to Eternity. You will re recognize this title as one that uh, is a part of a popular book and popular movie of yesteryear. The, uh, the title comes, first of all, from Rudyard Kipling, a poem that Kipling wrote in the latter part of the uh, 18th uh, 19th century, and then it was picked up in the title of the of the novel, and then the movie that was made in 1953. It was a very popular movie. It was second only to the Robe as the great movies of that particular time. But the thing that brings it to mind with me with me is 35 years ago I was preaching a gospel meeting in Fayetteville, Tennessee. As I came toward the close of that meeting, I was thinking about from this point on, we're closing the meeting out and you like to leave something in the minds of those that you are, that you are teaching and preaching to. And I was thinking, what can I preach on that will have an influence, an influence from that night on until the very time that we stand before the judgment of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. So I seized upon this title, From Here to Eternity. I look back upon that, I don't know why I never did preach on it again in that kind of way, but you're going to hear not the same lesson, but just the title that's involved, From Here to Eternity, and that's the kind of thing that's involved in this. The thesis is the necessity of faithful Christian conduct from this point of our lives from the point where we are today until the time that the Lord comes again, until the judgment day. In 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 11, we find the apostle saying, Seeing then that all of these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought you to be in all holy conversation? That's a question that all of us ought to ask ourselves. Peter had just been talking about the fact that all of this, the earth is going to melt with fervent heat, it's going to pass away with a great noise in view of the fact that all of this is going to come to an end. It's going to pass away, and as this passage says, all of these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought we to be? We love material things. We love new cars. We love beautiful homes. We love a lot of material things, and all of these things, ultimately, this passage is saying all of it is going to pass away, melt with fervent heat, pass away with a great noise, and then Peter is asking the question, in view of that fact, what kind of persons, what kind of persons ought we to be in all holy conversation or living and godliness? Christ is going to return, it is a reality. He will return, it is not simply a riddle, it is not something to be solved, it is not a code to be broken, but a day for us to anticipate. We sing the hymn, there's a great day coming, the words of this familiar hymn, and this particular song impress upon us something that we need to be deeply impressed with. There's a great day coming. Let's sing together. There's a great day coming, a great day coming. There's a great day coming by and by. When the saints and the sinners shall be parted right and left. Are you ready for the 
come. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? Are you ready? Are you ready for the judgment day? And we need to ask ourselves, what kind of an attitude do we have toward the Lord's return? Do we look forward to it with eager anticipation? The Apostle John in Revelation chapter 22, the closing verses, he says, Even so come, Lord Jesus. He was about 94, 95 years of age at that time. All of the other apostles were dead. He had seen the grave close around about them. And he says, in effect, I'm lingering here the last. He was ready for the Lord to come back again. I believe that we need to have that same kind of eager anticipation and the confidence that when the Lord returns, we shall receive the blessings that he has promised to those that are faithful. When that day does occur, it's not really something that we can know. The Bible teaches that it is a mystery from that kind of standpoint. The statement of Jesus in Matthew chapter 24 and verse 36, he says, but concerning Concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but nor the Son, but the Father only. They are those who would speculate. That has been true across the years. They're saying that the Lord will come at a certain date, and then it doesn't come, and they have egg on their face, and they're embarrassed, but there are others that come along, and they say, well, I, we figured it out. The Lord says, no man knows. It is a foolish thing for people to try to speculate on when the Lord will return. That's not the thing that we need to be so much concerned about. We simply need to be concerned about being ready when that time does come, that we can go home to be with the Lord. We need to recognize that, uh, that the Lord will come again at the end and there will be an eternity on life's other side. And I want us to think about this as we think about from here to eternity, what should we do? The importance is not when the Lord is going to come, but whether or not we have been faithful and we can hear him say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. So I, as I think with regard to this, I'm going to suggest to you a number of things that we need to be involved in. Those are the two passages that we already looked at in this lesson. But looking ahead, it said, I would say to you that we need to live. We need, we should live lives that are Christ-like from here to eternity. We need to be faithful in our Christian living. We need to live as God would have us to live. I believe that's what Peter is suggesting as he says in 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 21. For even hereunto were you called, because Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. Jesus Christ is our example. We need to walk as he walked. We need to walk in his steps. We need to have the mind of Christ within us. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Not only should we walk in his steps and have the kind of attitude that Jesus had, the kind of mind that he had toward things, but we need to do the kind of deeds that Jesus did. The statement is made in Acts chapter 10 and verse 38 that God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power who went about doing good and healing those who were oppressed of the devil. Jesus Christ's life was a perfect life. It was in perfect harmony with the teachings that God sent him in the world to communicate to mankind. We need to recognize not only was his life one in perfect harmony, but he cared enough as he came into the world to die for you and me that our sins might be forgiven. He loved unconditionally. He did the Father's will. And if we walk in the path of righteousness as our Lord walked in the path of righteousness, we can be pleasing and acceptable in his sight. Not only should we be people that uh, 
try to live, strive to live a life that is a Christ-like life, but on the other hand also, we need to be mindful of the fact the Bible teaches we need to be striving to save our families. We need to do everything that we can to bring them to a knowledge of what God would have them and to influence them to walk as God ha would have them to walk. I look back to the, to the Old Testament to Noah. At the time that the world was becoming very, very wicked, God said to Noah, build thee an ark of gopher wood. He called him a preacher of righteousness. For 120 years, while the ark was preparing, Noah was able to save only, only his family. Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives were the only ones that was a very wicked age, the only ones that were saved out of all of the, out of all of the world. That sounds very discouraging. I doubt if, as a preacher of righteousness, if they had a gospel advocate, he would have written to the gospel advocate and reported how few he had saved at that particular time. It sounds very difficult to live in that kind of age. But what I'm suggesting to you today is that from one standpoint, he was very successful. He saved his family. I remember one who was a, a good man, an elder in the Lord's Church in Decatur, Alabama, at the Beltline Congregation, Brother Luke Cagle, said time and again, he said, if we could, brethren, if we could just save our own families, we would be doing a great deal. He was a man with a large family, and he did have a great and good influence upon them. But we need to do everything that we can to reach out to save our family. In 1 Peter 3 and verse 20, it says that the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. I think also not only of Noah and his preaching and his saving his family, but the statement by Joshua in Joshua 24 and verse 15, where he says, As for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. He had just said, Choose you this day, charging Israel to make a choice of whom they would serve. Choose you this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house, we will serve Jehovah. And then I think of that statement as we uh, think of a Abraham, a great and good man. In Genesis 18 and verse 19, the Lord said of this good man, he said, I know him that he will keep, he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord and do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he has spoken of him. As parents today, we need people like Abraham, like Noah, like Joshua, who will bring up their children as they should. Ephesians 4, and rather 5 and verse 4 says, Ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up. Don't let them just grow up. Don't let television raise your children. Christian parents ought to bring their children up, Paul says, in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. But not only should we have Christ-like lives and strive to do everything we can to save our families, but it's also important that we be supremely committed to the church, totally committed to the church and to the work of the Lord. We're to give our bodies as living sacrifices, the Bible teaches. And in Ephesians chapter 20 and verse 28, as Paul came back by Ephesus, meeting the elders of the church at Ephesus, he says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock which the Holy Spirit hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. These men were to be concerned very much about the church and the kind of faithfulness that would characterize it. We need to love the church. We need to understand that the church of Christ is the New Testament church, it is built upon the principles that are laid down in God's holy book. Jesus reigns over it, and uh, he will ultimately put all enemies under his feet. 1 Corinthians 15 and verse 25. In verse 24 it says, Then cometh the end, and he shall deliver up the kingdom to the Father. The kingdom and the church are the same thing. It is the body of Christ, and we need to do everything that we can to 
be committed to it and to be faithful to it and do that which the Lord would have us to do as faithful servants in his kingdom. Not only these things, but also I would suggest to you that we should strive, we should strive to promote unity and peace and harmony within the church. Satan recognized very early that if he could divide the church, he could lessen the effect of the gospel of Christ. And so we find him, Paul writing to the church at Corinth and urging them to be of the same mind and the same judgment that there was division among them. And Paul was certainly concerned about that. In Ephesians chapter one and verses one through six, we find him saying, endeavoring to keep the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace, and then delineating the various things that are part the principles of that unity, that there is one body. The word one body refers to the one church. The one body, one hope, one Lord, one faith, and one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all and through all and in you all. We live in a day and age when people will say, what faith are you of? They didn't have that kind of problem then. There was just, there was just that one faith. That's what Paul was saying, that one faith. There was just one body, and there was just one Lord. One might as well, as he speaks about what, what, what body are you of, or what church are you of, to say what Lord are you going to worship, what God are you going to worship. There was to be one, and that was the principles upon, of unity upon which the church was to be built. The Lord's church today needs to be united, its pulse needs to beat in unison, as it were. We need to use the Bible as our guide in faith and practice and never allow false doctrine and opinions and suppositions to lead the church into error, liberalism, or legalism. We are not to bind where the Lord has not bound or to loose where the Lord has not loosed. We're to be people indeed who do what the Lord commands in the way that he commands it. We need to stand four square upon the Bible, not swaying to the left or to the right. Peter said in Acts 5 and verse 29, as he made a statement with regard to the other, Peter and the other apostles answered, we ought to obey God rather than men. Men try to sway us to do things that God would not have us to do and uh, to change the church, but we must do what God commands us to do. And then I would say to you today that we need to work to save the lost. We need to be people that are conscious of the needs of those that are lost. The purpose of this gospel meeting is to get the message of God to those that are lost and need to hear the gospel of Christ. It, we, we need to recognize the Great Commission. Jesus said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, Mark 16, 15, and 16. Jesus had stated in Matthew 28, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. We are to make disciples of all nations. We are to teach them all things whatsoever Jesus said, whatsoever I have commanded you. This is a matter of the missionary spirit of reaching out to those that are lost, not only to our families and our neighbors and our friends, to people of every race, tribe, and tongue, of all of the continents of the earth and all of the islands of the sea to carry the gospel wherever there are those who need to hear the gospel of Christ. We do not recognize, I'm afraid, how terrible it is to be lost. There were those in the 15th chapter of the book of, uh, book of Luke who were criticizing Jesus because he associated with sinners. Jesus came to seek and to save the lost. In the 19th chapter of Luke, we find it saying, the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. In fact, it was said when he was born, in Matthew 1 and verse 21, that she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. That was the full, he was the fulfillment of that prophecy from Isaiah, and it's stated so in this particular passage. That's what he came for. But then Jesus, 
here in Matthew chapter 16, 15, begins to teach a number of messages, or with a number of illustrations of what it means to be lost. In verses 1 through 7, we find him dealing with a sheep that had gone, of a, hun a sheep out of a hundred sheep that had been, been lost. The shepherd would go and leave the ninety and nine that were in the fold and seek that one lost sheep, and when he found it, he would rejoice because that which was lost had been found. Moving on down in the chapter, verses 8 through 10, a lady had lost a coin. Out of her ten coins, she had lost one. This was her treasure, and it was something that uh, was very important to her. Have you ever lost any money? You could lose a thousand dollars and make another thousand dollars, but if you lose your soul, it's the only soul that you're going to ever have. She, Jesus says, swept the house. She swept looking for the coin, and when she found it, she called her neighbors and friends together and said, Rejoice, I have found that which was lost. Three stories in this chapter. The other one is the story of a lost boy. We call him the prodigal son. The difference between these three is that, first of all, the sheep was lost by his own action. He didn't mean to. He didn't get up that morning and say, what I need to do today is go out and get myself lost. He just wandered away, but he was lost nevertheless, even though he didn't mean to. On the other hand, the coin was lost by someone else. The coin wasn't by the coin's action. Someone else had lost it, but it was lost nevertheless. The sheep, the uh, boy went out and decided he wanted to leave his father's house. He comes to his father and said, give me the portion of my inheritance. He got the inheritance that would come to him and immediately he took a journey into a far country and there began to waste his substance and riotous living. And finally, when a great famine came on the land, he realized how desperate things were with him. He had to go and join himself to one of the citizens of the country and to feed swine. Think about a Jewish boy. Jewish boys couldn't have anything to do with pigs. They couldn't uh, participate in that, but that's the only thing he could. Nobody gave anything to him. In fact, the Bible says he fain would have filled his stomach with the husk that the hogs did eat. That's pretty bad when you're down to the point of wanting to eat the hog's food. But finally he came to himself and said, I will go to my father. I will say I have sinned against heaven in thy sight. Make me as one of thy hired servants. You remember the story. How that the father came when he saw him a long way off, went out and threw his arms around his neck and said, This my son was dead and is alive. He called for a robe to be put on his back, shoes on his feet, a ring upon his finger. He was reinstating him. The son had said, make me a hired servant, but the father made him back as a son. What a beautiful, beautiful story. But in this, Jesus is teaching a lesson. What it means to be lost, how terrible it is to be lost. We get so concerned about a child that's lost. We put out an APB everywhere. We put out an alert with regard to them. We're very concerned about a child that's lost or a soldier that's lost behind enemy lines or whatever it may be. But we're unconcerned so many times when a member of the body of Christ wanders away and gets lost. We need to be concerned about that. We need to be people who work hard to save those they're lost to do whatever we can in order to restore them to the kind of relationship that God would have them to have. And then I would suggest to you as we move on in this that we need urgently to keep our name in the book of life. Is your name in the book of life today? That's the question that all of us need to ask. There is right now in heaven the book of life Moses was aware of it. In Exodus 32, 32, he said, If thou wilt forgive their sins, he's praying on behalf of Israel. And he says, If not, blot me, I pray thee, out of thy book which thou hast written. Paul was aware of it. 
In Philippians 4 and verse 3, he said, I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which have labored with me in the gospel with Clement also and other of my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. We need to be aware of the importance of being in that book of life. Jesus told his disciples in Luke chapter 10 and verse 20, not to rejoice because the devils were subject to them, but to rejoice because their names were written in heaven. The book of life is a book that carries the names of all of those that are the redeemed. Is your name in that book today? Is your name in that book right now? Your name was placed there if you became a Christian. It will remain there if you live faithful, a faithful life. The books ultimately will be open. In our reading this morning, Brother Paul, in reading from Revelation chapter 20, in verses 11 through 15, John, by vision, looked far into the future and said, I saw a great white throne, and him that sat thereon, from whose face the earth and heavens fled away. And he begins to talk about the book of life and those that are in the book of life. We need to look and be concerned about Someday we'll stand at the judgment bar. We sang just a moment ago about the great day that is coming the day when we shall stand before the judge and hear the Lord say, Either depart or enter thou into the joys of thy Lord. The most important thing, the most important thing in life is whether your name is written in heaven. And the way that you live from this point, this point, this day, until the Lord comes again will determine whether your name is in the Lamb's book of life. And so as we come to the end of the lesson today, we're going to be singing the song, the invitation song that urges upon you to respond to heaven's call. If you're not a Christian today, your name is not there, but it can be written there. Those who obeyed the gospel in Acts chapter 2 it says that they were added to them that day about 3,000 souls. Their name was written in heaven. The question today with regard to every one of us, has our name been blotted out? Has it been written there? Have you obeyed the gospel of Christ? Why not today come to confess your faith in Christ, to give your heart and life to him, turning from your sins, repenting from your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, being baptized into him. And if you're away as a Christian and need to return, may I urge you to do that today. Do it now as together we stand and as we sing.